Hi everyone, this is Mike with Mantis Machinery Solutions. Today we're going to be talking about PLCs. So this is just going to be a brief intro where we'll spend about 20 minutes or so, a little bit less hopefully, and this is a small portion of what we cover in our Fundamentals of CNC Machinery training class. If you'd like more information, you can check us out on the web, www.mantismachinery.com. Okay, let's get started. So PLCs, most of you have probably heard the term, uh, or at least heard them referred to. Uh, basically, PLC is an acronym and it stands for Programmable Logic Controller. You may have already known that much, uh, but it may or may not mean anything to you. So let's go a little bit deeper. Programmable, so it can be changed or modified without much difficulty. Uh, the key is you can change software to make it act a different way as compared to having to re redo wiring and things like that. Everybody in the facility or an operator or an end user might not even be able to change the programming, but certainly the OEM or the manufacturer can and most uh, facilities have somebody that can uh, rewrite the PLC program. Um, and then the next step is logic. Basically it determines an output based on an input. So if this, then that. Um, and that's the whole idea. And then we have controller, which is a type of computer. So programmable logic controller, and that's a PLC. That still might not be much, so let's go a little bit deeper yet. Okay, when I think of a PLC, um, I kind of think uh, like to think of it in terms of what does it accomplish, and that's what I think is very important why they came up with them. So I've drawn here a very simple set of uh, say this is a factory and this is the automation. And keep in mind that if I'm a big automotive facility, I might have hundreds of different machines. But let's imagine that we have these six machines, and machines one, two, and three here are a certain type of machine, and they're doing something with metal. They're cutting the metal. And then machines four, five, and six are doing a next step. And maybe they're welding, or they are uh, cleaning, or deburring, dunk tank, something along those lines. Well, if I had a very simple conveyor system, and I would connect machine one directly to machine four, two to machine five, three to machine six, can you all see how that presents some different problems? For example, those machine, machine one might not be the same speed as machine four. So perhaps um, I'm wasting machine productivity. So in reality, it might be that machines one, two, and three produce 100 parts an hour, but to produce 100 parts an hour of the second type of machine, I only need two of them. So in other words, a three to two ratio. So if I have one connected to the next one, then I'm wasting uh, some machine time, right? Uh, another possibility is what happens if machine four goes down for maintenance. So I have to take that out of my loop for a while. Well, then what do I do with machine one? Why should it have to sit idle just because machine four is down in maintenance, right? Um, and vice versa. If machine one is down, I don't want to have to, t to automatically take down. Does that make sense? So the much better system would be to change the, the way this is configured, right? So, you know, if I, I said earlier, uh, there could be a three to two ratio, and this is just an example, of course. Um, you know, so okay, I could, I could try to make it a little bit better because it, that extra machine that I didn't really need cost a lot of money. So I could, okay, I could put two of these machines into, into one here, um, but still you realize that there, that's a problem too, right? Um, because again, uh, machine five is, going to have a little bit of idle time. On the other hand, machine four is going to be overworked. So these parts, some, some parts are going to be stacked up off of one and two waiting to go into machine four, right? And even worse is if this machine goes down, well, I'm really hosed, right? So, okay. So let's talk about another way to configure everything. Um, and that would be, for example, to have machines one, two, and three, and they're all doing our little metal grinding or cutting or something. And they all go into a chute. Uh, or a single conveyor, uh, and this could be multiple, but the key is um, that there's some sort of logic, some sort of decision-making tool that tells it, okay, from here, where do I send the parts? Do I send them to machine four or machine five? And that's probably done with a machine-ready signal or a limit switch going into the machine itself if there's already a part being processed. So basically, they'll go to whichever machine is ready for a part. Um, same thing on the inlet here, right? Um, I have my parts coming off of something, maybe they're coming off of one type of machine, and then um, there'll be some sort of logic set up here to decide, okay, which way should I go? Should I come down to this machine? Should I come down to this machine? 
and and this would be more like a true Y as compared to the way I've got it drawn here but you get the idea right that way if any machine is down no problem the PLC will just route those parts to the next machine same thing over here if a machine is down okay we'll just route machine well, route parts this way right so this is um, the best overall way to set up an automation system but it of course takes this thing called PLC to do it so now let's talk about how PLC works um, can you imagine the type of wiring and electrical system that would be involved in trying to make this thing work um, a lot of contactors and relays and all this stuff because you know if uh, one condition is made I'd have to have a contactor that opens and closes the belt going to the next conveyor system you know and, and this gets very very complicated especially if I try to change things and if later I wanted to add another machine or I wanted to take one down for maintenance so it would be a, be a nightmare to try to wire this without a PLC um, so uh, what happens if I have a system that has multiple sensor switches heaters solenoids motors uh, it gets complicated um, I'm not smart enough to wire that or if I did, it would take me a very long time. So we have this guy that came up with the concept of PLC. And this came up, I think it was back in the 60s, um, for automation factories. And the idea is I take this PLC and I have an input card. And all of the things that send a signal in go into the input card. And that could be different things like temperature switches, push limit switch, push button, a ready signal from another device. Um, notice these things are all switches, buttons, they're all digital. In most cases the PLC is going to deal mostly with digital signals. Often it's 24 volts DC. Um, you can have some bigger PLCs that, are an that also have analog, but let's we'll keep it simple for right now. Um, and then we have an output card. And on the output card we have all the outputs. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, so a signal going to an indicator light or a solenoid valve to move a piston, something to turn on a contactor that might uh, start a pump or a motor to turn a conveyor, going to an alarm siren, maybe a ready signal to another device. Now I've got this shown as an input card and an output card. If it's a small PLC, there might only be one card. It could be an input slash output card. And maybe on that card would be three or four inputs and three or four different outputs. On the other hand, I could have a PLC that has dozens of input cards and dozens of output cards. This huge system. So they um, are very, a lot of different configurations and sizes, but they all function in similar ways. So we're going to have all of the inputs going into a centralized location and all the outputs coming from a centralized location. Notice we don't have any, any logic here as far as contactors and all this extra wiring um, in series or trying to make it so that if the limit switch or the push button is made it's doing something right because that's all done within the PLC itself in the software so let's talk a little bit about how that software works so what the program looks like typically program has done in what's called ladder logic and you can see this here uh, looks a little bit like a ladder um, I've got a left side and a right side and then I have these rungs and the, the reason it was originally drawn like this is because it's very looks very similar to an electrical diagram. So on the left hand side, imagine that I have my input power, so my um, my hot. On the right hand side, imagine that I have common, right? And my goal is to connect these two paths together, right? Through a rung. And here I have my rung. And when I'm writing the program, on my rung, I'm going to add symbols that represent uh, fake contacts and fake uh, solenoid things like that. So for example, I have this rung and I want to turn on output number two. Output number two is from my output card and right now I've got it drawn as say it's a heating element. Okay, and in this path I have input number one and I have it drawn like a open, a normally open contact, right? And the idea here is if input number one is made or high or if there's 24 volts on it so in other words a condition exists um, that would cause this contact to close so 24 volts on that input then it's going to act like a contactor that closes it's going to complete this current path and turn on output number two so it's really that simple um, for this 
this first rung, the only condition that needs to be made in order to create an output is to have an input on temperature uh, on number one, which I've got labeled as a temperature sensor. This could be anything else. Now, as the temperature of whatever I'm trying to heat rises, then it's going to then it's going to remove that input here and open up this path and the output is going to turn off, right? The great thing about PLCs is in many cases the manufacturer has it set up so that I can look at this ladder and literally see which inputs are made and which outputs are made. They'll they'll be highlighted or they'll go bold or something that I can check very quickly and that is great for troubleshooting purposes. Okay, well that was a very simple one. I can of course get more complicated. Uh, so here to, to produce output number two, I've added a couple extra things. So I have this symbol here, which is again, like a normally open contact. Um, so in other words, input number one would have to be made to close this. Input two no would have to be made to close this. And then input three would have to be not made or have a zero. So what I would be looking for is 24 volts or a one, right? A one and a zero. And if those three conditions are made, then I've completed my path of current and output number two turns on. Does that make sense? So for example, I might have this set up. I was talking about this heating element. Imagine it's a tank and well, I don't want the uh, output, I don't want the heaters to turn on unless uh, the temperature is low, so I need to heat it up. Well, I don't. I have a overpressure condition, right? I don't want to blow up the tank, so I want to make sure I'm uh, below a certain pressure set point. And then I want to make sure the safety door is closed or something like that, right? So it's set up so if I open the door, it would create a one here, right? Um, so there we go, we create an output and output number two goes high and produces 24 volts. Sorry, it's tough to draw with a mouse here. Um, now, in both of these cases, um, I was looking for a set of conditions to exist. For example, here I needed one and I needed two and I needed three all to exist in order to get this output. Well, that would be represented as an and. The other possibility would be an OR. So I could have, notice I have this parallel path, right? So it wouldn't matter what the condition of any of these is if this path were completed. Notice it's also going to provide, quote, power to output number two. And maybe this is the manual override on the uh, push button panel. So I could either have the heaters turn on based on the temperature, the pressure, and all the, the door, or I could push a manual override, in which case that's the only condition that needs to be met, and it would produce an output, on, um, output number two. Does that make sense? And the way the PLC works is it, it functions as a loop. So I might have hundreds of different lines in this whole thing. Remember we talked about there could be dozens of input-output cards. So it is constantly, it starts from the top and it scans the status of all of the inputs and then it writes to all of the outputs and then it does that loop again. And this whole process is done in milliseconds. And depending on the, the grade or the brand of the control, um, that may be done faster or slower. And some of the higher end ones are a little bit quicker than some of the, the cheaper ones that you might buy online. But they all function as this sort of loop, okay? This was ladder logic. Um, oh, there's one more thing I'd like to mention. Uh, they're called timers, counters, and keep relays. Let me clear this again. And basically they are software. So for example, you could have a timer that is not a physical device. It's, it's built into the software, into the PLC, and its job is to time. <laughs> Pretty simple. So let's say I had, um, in this case, output number three was some sort of a lubrication pump. And I have input number five, so maybe that's a push button switch or some sort of sensor that tells it, okay, we need to lubricate the axis. And we also know that the pump, if it runs for 10 seconds, that's enough oil. That's enough oil or grease or whatever we're using. So I would set this timer in the software for 10 seconds, and then any time uh, we got the signal to lubricate, this timer would count 
10 seconds and then once it's expired it opens up the path and output number three or the pump turns off okay so the timer is built in and if you have a CNC machine tool sometimes uh, they'll have timers to turn on exactly that a lubrication pump or um, a coolant pump a spray valve things along those lines um, some machines have uh, a waiting time so for example if I'm taking a, have an automation system in a factory and I put something I put some metal in a dunk tank and it goes back into the the conveyor maybe it needs to count time to make sure that it doesn't go to the next process until X amount of time so I might have a timer for that okay um, there's something else called a counter and a counter does exactly that it counts and I could set it for 10 or 20 and maybe there's an automatic lubrication cycle on this machine and it keeps track of every time we move the X axis and it says okay every hundred times I want you to do something turn on the lubrication pump so we would use a counter for that and then the last is this keep relay and the keep relay relay is basically on or off I could go in and turn it on or turn it off it stays in that state so it's not usually something that's changed uh, very often and maybe it would signify an option in the software uh, for example if a machine does or does not have the automation automatic lube cycle I would turn off this keep relay and then um, it would be a path for example in here and the keep relay is turned off so if the customer didn't purchase that particular option well then they're never going to get the pump to automatically turn on okay so that's the concept um, I really like this system because it's very visual and like I said most manufacturers uh, will show some way that you can tell if uh, the conditions are made or not the other alternative would be within the PLC cabinet you would you could probably see you could probably look at physically where the wires are going into the PLC and they usually have LED indicators so if on my human machine interface I can't see um, them highlighted I could go back into my control cabinet and see and if they don't have those LEDs well that's fine you can get out your multimeter and measure does that condition exist so for troubleshooting purposes it becomes very easy because if for example let's let's take this simple one that we talked about if my heating element isn't turning on well I have a couple of different possibilities either the heating element or the wiring up to it is broken or the PLC isn't actually telling it to turn on right so I can look and see is the PLC producing an output here at number two is there 24 volts there or not um, if there's not well then it again becomes pretty easy I can look to see which one of these conditions isn't made and then trace out that wiring right and maybe I have a problem with the PLC uh, IO card itself but either way it becomes very easy to isolate the problem all right one more thing that I'd like to mention some of the newer PLCs use basic programming Often there's a ladder program in the background, but in order to make it easier to program, they have what's called basic. And literally the program will look like if this, then that. So the programmer will write in if input number one equals one or high, then output one equals one. Or if one equals one and two equals zero and three equals whatever, then output number three you get the idea and it could also be if input one or input two then right so it's just a different way to program and it depends on what you're comfortable with so somewhere in that interface uh, is this program that's really it for our intro to PLC's uh, we hope you check out our website and feel free to contact us if you're interested in taking the week-long course where we go into much more detail and we talk also about how in a CNC machine the PLC is probably going to interface with a CNC and we talk about the difference between the two 